morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, it's nice to be back. It's been a couple weeks away, and uh, I'm ready to be home to get back to my schedule. So, um, to start today off, we have some announcements. Um, there's just a few of them. I believe most, if not all, are in the bulletin. But I do want to point a couple of them out to you. Um, today, we are doing a love offering for the Dean family. Um, if you are doing a cash donation, because we are going to do this along with our normal offering, if you're going to do a cash donation, there are some envelopes out on the table out there. If you're going to do cash, that way you can address it to the Dean family. <clears throat> that way they can make the delineation between your own offerings. Um, also today, um, Corinne Verner, her bridal shower is today at 2, 2 to 4, here at the church in the basement. Um, any and all women are invited. <laughs> So guys, I'm not sure if there's a game on the day, but hopefully it falls between two and four. So uh, please keep that in mind and arrive for that to, uh, to help them with that. Um, there is a cleanup, higher ground. Um, for those who don't know, our summit camp is done higher, higher ground, and um, they are going to clean up the grounds a little bit in preparation for summit. That is on May 11th, 18th, and 25th. I had all those right. Um, that starts at 9 a.m. and I'm assuming it will take everything most of the day or whatever time, time you can get would be appreciated, I'm sure. Um, with that, we'll segue into an announcement about Summit. So Summit is June 16th to the 21st. Um, it's called Masterpiece. Uh, we're trying something new this year where the third, fourth, and fifth graders are going to be doing their own thing. And then the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders are going to be doing their thing. Um, so trying to meet um, the full gamut of age groups there. So something new, so we're utilizing a lot of people this year. So applications for both uh, camp and SALT are out there on the information booth. Uh, they're due, I think, May 25th to Andrew. So if everybody could get those to me as soon as possible. Um, $50 deposit and then the rest is determined once we know how many kiddos are going. Um, so definitely, um, would love to see as many kids as we can at camp and try to get those numbers up. We had about 80 campers last year, so if we can beat that this year, that would be awesome. Um, Bedford's coming down with 25, Troy has got 16, so if we can try to beat them, that would be always a good thing to make our picture, North Hills picture, bigger uh, than everybody else's. So get those forms, definitely. And then the other thing we have, we have a lot of food left over from the Northeast Conference yesterday. Um, please stop downstairs and grab a sandwich on your way home. <laughs> There's lots of food There's to make and veggies, so please go downstairs and eat. <laughs> okay, well, with that, we'll open a prayer. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the gifts you give us in our lives. Um, help us to appreciate those and to use them to glorify your kingdom. We pray Jesus' name. Last week we opened our Easter service um, reading from Ephesians 2, the first couple of verses, and I'm going to continue that today because it flows right into our next song. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He has created a great work in each of you, um, and he has put that in your hearts. We are his entirely. Will you please stand and worship with us as we say, we are yours.
time in our service, we have our prayer requests and praises. First, I'd like to give everybody a big thank you and a praise for our Northeast Conference hosted yesterday. Uh, we hosted it, and uh, all the people that prepared and brought food, and it uh, seemed like it went off very well. <clears throat> and uh, thank everyone for that. Uh, do we have any prayer requests? Yeah. Um, I would like prayers for our uncle, Phil Queen. Um, he has uh, cancer, non-functioning kidneys, and macular degeneration. So he's in the hospital. So we would appreciate prayers. Phil Queen. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Uh, remember, John called us his home this morning sick. John. Uh, um, I'd like to thank the congregation for the love offering that you're generously doing for um, the family and on behalf of Scott and Teresa that I, it's been very difficult with Rachel's passing and um, we're still coping with that. But I wanted to share that Hi. at one time we were, uh, Rachel and Hannah and I were visiting with the Ellis and Russ and Russ asked Rachel, he said, you know, you're very ill, you have so much pain, you have so many complications and it keeps on going. I said, how do you cope with that? And um, she said, she shared her faith and her faith in God and what that was all about. But then she said, I know that I can cope with this because I have people around me who love me and will always take care of me. And I, I think that's evident in this church, too. You know, it's another group of people who really care and they love her and want to help her. The faults and the generals that I'm doing that. Thank you, Donna. <coughs> there is Simmons, who we've been talking about now for three years. Um, he's down to days. Uh, left. Um, they called the staff together on Friday for a staff meeting and we have a crisis team in place. Um, so be thinking about the Fitzsimmons and the Hobby family, but also all of the kids' lives whose Barrett has touched, along with the teachers. Like we're pulling in people from Clark County because the teachers aren't going to be able to do it um, to work with the kids. And we have responses and things to talk to the kids about. So Barrett's a third writer and you know the fact that he's still hung on this week is, is a, mir a miracle all in and of itself. And his third grade teacher took her one year old, Barrett loves babies, so she took her one year old son to see Barrett and he slept most of the time that she was there but he did get a smile when she set Sawyer down he gave a smile. So definitely um, prayers for the whole Northwestern community. Um, when Barrett finally does decide to take that last breath. So. <coughs> Barrett is a, not only local, he, it's everywhere you go. You see the signs in other districts and people doing things to remember Barrett. So it's going to be a hard time, so uh, just remember that whole family. Other? Uh, unspoken? Thank you, man. We'll pray to uh, God for these uh, requests and also uh, pray for the offering afterwards. And like I say, the Dean Love, all, love Offering, just put it in your uh, prayers of passes. And uh, if you need an envelope to give later or something, there's envelopes out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for the for the untimely news of Barrett and his family, we just ask a special prayer for them. We know this has been uh, three years of up, down, up, and down. It's finally down, and uh, it looks, unless you intercede, it will be uh, death coming to Barrett. So just remember that whole family and the community and the teachers and everyone associated with him has touched many lives. We thank you for Donna's testimony and for the daughter that testified that God in her life, her friends around her, godly friends around her kept her going and we pray for uh, the people
people mentioned here with the cancer and whatever problems there are and all for the unspoken also, Father. We come to you in Jesus' name because that's he is our answer. He is our amazing, amazing Savior. Now we ask the blessing upon the uh, offering today. God's tithes and our offerings and also the we just bless it and have it uh, be used for the good of everybody involved. Be with Kyle today as he brings the morning message and be with those who are not with us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
your kiddos. <laughs> Amen. I hope you can see the love in God's eyes as he laid his son down for you as we just, uh, this is the time of the season for us to remember that as last week uh, we capped off an extraordinary week, uh, the greatest week in history, a uh, week in which started um, on Palm Sunday where Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem and uh, the Jews are shouting praise to him, shouting Hosanna, save us now David, or save us now Jesus the son of David. And uh, five days later, as we remembered on uh, Good Friday, uh, the Jews were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And uh, Christ, Christ didn't just die on the cross, but he suffered on the cross for six hours. And he went through a lot of turmoil before then, mocks, spit at, slap, uh, struck, he got whipped. Uh, he went through it all. And then last Sunday, uh, thank goodness, uh, we were able to celebrate Easter Sunday or the Resurrection Sunday. And that's a day where we get to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because yes, Jesus was dead for, for a short bit, but Jesus, thank goodness, rose victoriously from the grave and he conquered death. And I told you guys last week that Jesus victoriously rising from the grave can serve as a reminder to us that we too one day will victoriously rise from the grave. For when Jesus comes back to this earth, we too will be risen from the dead just like Jesus was 2,000 years ago and will be risen to everlasting life and eternal life and we will partake in the pleasures of the kingdom of God. As Jesus, when he comes back to this earth, he will bring God's kingdom here to this earth. And that is the hope that we have as Christians. That one day we too are going to be resurrected just like Jesus and we are going to be able to partake in the pleasures of the kingdom. And so the next couple of weeks, we're going to spend time talking about what exactly the kingdom is and, and what it looks like. So to start off, uh, have any of you guys ever played uh, the game of telephone? You know, where, where you get in a circle or something and uh, th there's a secret. Uh, maybe like five or ten people, you get in a circle and the starting p person, they tell a secret to the person to the right or to the left. And then that person tells a secret to the next and the secret continues along. And the secret may start off like something like, it's usually kind of funny. It's like, you smell funny on Fridays. And so they'll, they'll whisper that to all their friends, you smell funny on Fridays, you smell funny on Fridays. And they'll get to the last person, and the last person is supposed to say what they heard. And the last person will say something like, I like tacos. And you go, what? What in the world? That's not at all what I said. I said, you smell funny on tacos. But the last person, the message that he heard was, I like tacos. But that's not at all what was told. And so we see in just a minute or two, we can see how much a message can be changed. That's just in a minute of people telling different people the message that they hear, the message can change dramatically. And the story can get mixed up so fast. So you, you, hear, you hear the guy who, yeah, last week I caught a fish this big. And then the next week was, yeah, I caught a fish this big. And a month from now, it's like, I caught a two-yard fish, guys. You'll never believe it. The stories change after time goes by. And now I have a dear, dear, sweet, great-grandma. Um, as I've told you guys before, 98, still, still in, in, in decent health. She's living on her own. She, she's driving, for goodness sakes. Um, she, she's a very independent woman. She strives to hit to the age 106 because her aunt was 105, and she wants to beat her aunt. So all the power to my great-grandma. Now, my great-grandma tells a story that she went bowling, and in her first game of bowling, she scored a perfect 300. And she believes it. She is sincere. She sincerely thinks that her first game of bowling, she scored a perfect 300. And I hope my great-grandma is, is not going to watch this in the future because I don't believe her. I don't believe her that in her first game ever of bowling that she scored a perfect 300. That's unheard of. But as time goes by, our stories change. And, and my great, she, she's not lying. She doesn't think she's lying. She sincerely believes that she scored a perfect 300. And she, we'll, she'll tell all of our family and we'll go, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right on, Grandma. All the power to you. But we don't believe it because stories change 
after time, just as we see when we play the game of telephone. The story or, or the sentence, it changes in just a short amount of time. And so the game of telephone, which lasts maybe a minute, the story changes, or the, the phrase and the sentence can change dramatically. Now think about the grand picture, the, the big scheme of things. When we look at Jesus, who was alive 2,000 years ago, think of all the time that there was for, for his story to have changed. And then this is a very great danger. It's an evident danger that's been occurring the past 2,000 years. And now don't worry. I did the math for you. But think about it. There's 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, 365 days in a year, and Jesus lived about 2,000 years ago. You know how many minutes that is? That's over 1 billion minutes ago. Now, 1 billion is a number that we can hardly even fathom. Like, I, I doubt you guys could even fathom the number of 1 million, but 1 billion is, is way greater than, than 1 million. To help give you guys an idea of how big 1 billion is, if you take a stack of $100 bills, and if you compact it as tight as it can go, a stack of $100 $1 bills is 0.43 inches. That's about yay big. You know, you, you put the stack right here, and it's about yay big, 100. That, that's, that's, a lot of, uh, that's a lot of $100 uh, bills right there. If you were to take $1 billion bills, the stack would reach 358,510 feet. Or miles, that's 67.9 miles high. That's, that's a, a large stack uh, of dollar bills. That, that's starting from the ground and, and 67.9 uh, miles high. That reached the lower portion of the troposphere, one, one of the Earth's main layers of the atmosphere. That's crazy. One billion is a huge, huge, huge number that we can't seem to comprehend. And if we think about that Jesus was alive over one billion minutes ago, how much has his story and his message could have changed in that time. And that's exactly what I believe has taken place. And it should come as no surprise to us. It should come as no surprise that we see in the game of telephone, a story changes in one minute. But of course, in 2,000 years, people are going to think the message has changed. And everybody has their own idea and what Jesus' ministry, what his gospel message was all about. And everybody hears what everybody else says. And everybody has these different opinions. And, and they just believe what they say without looking at the words themselves. And, and, and this message can get so twisted and it can get so muddied up. And so this morning, I want to go over what exactly was the message that Jesus had to the people around him. And we're going to take a look back in, in our Bibles to see exactly what Jesus said. Because, because all sorts of people will tell you all sorts of different things and what Jesus' ministry was all about. You, you hear a lot of people who say Jesus' ministry was all about that, you know, when, when you die, you, you go to heaven, or people may think that his ministry was all about his death and resurrection. Uh, there, there's just so many ideas and what people think Jesus' ministry, what, what he talked to his people was all about. So this morning, we're going to look at the words of Jesus himself and those uh, close to him. So if you have your Bibles... Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, start in Matthew chapter 3. We're going to spend a good uh, chunk of time here in the book of Matthew. We're, we're going to kind of start from the beginning and go through the end and see what the ministry of Jesus was all about. And now many of these verses I shared with you guys a, uh, a couple years ago while I was here in the summer um, as they're extremely important. And you can bet that we'll talk about these same verses again in a couple years from now because these verses that we're about to share are so important. As we're going to see what the message of Jesus and, and, the, and his followers and those close to him was all about. And, and we need to know this because all sorts of people will tell you all sorts of different things. But we need to see what Jesus himself said that his ministry was all about. So, so if you have a highlight or a pen and you like to highlight or underline uh, your Bible, th these passages that we'll be reading this morning are fabulous verses for you to highlight or to underline. So the first passage that we'll be reading is Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and we're just going to read verses 1 and 2. And this is about John the Baptist. 
John the Baptist uh, was the cousin of Jesus, and he, he was just a smidge older than Jesus. Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, was pregnant at the same time as Mary was pregnant with Jesus. So, so John the Baptist, just a couple months older uh, than Jesus, John the Baptist had one, one main responsibility in his life. And that responsibility, that job, was to prepare the way for the Lord. Because if you remember, the Jews were waiting for their Savior to come, the Christ to come, for 2,000 years. Or more than 2,000 years, these Jews were waiting for Christ to come. And finally, it was time for Christ to come. And so John the Baptist's job, it was his job to prepare their minds and their hearts for their, for their arrival of their Lord and Savior, Christ, who happened to be Jesus of Nazareth. And so we see in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it reads, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John the Baptist, as he's preparing the way for the people to get ready for Jesus, his message was simple. His message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> the message that John the Baptist had to get ready for, for the Savior was about none other than the kingdom. John the Baptist thought the people needed to hear a message about the kingdom. Because the kingdom was coming and they needed to get ready. They needed to repent for the kingdom was coming. And so that was the message that John the Baptist shared with, with the followers around him uh, to get ready for Christ. It was a message about the kingdom. And if we continue in the story, uh, we see later in the chapter that uh, John the Baptist, he baptizes Jesus. And uh, God tells the people who are present there that this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And then later on we see, we may know the story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted by the devil. Um, because Jesus, uh, being a man, is, is tempted, was tempted just like you and me. And so Jesus withhold that temptation. He, he stood his ground. And so we see, and starting, we're just going to read Matthew 4, 17. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus didn't really start his earthly ministry until scholars think about the age 30. Jesus spent about the first 30 years of his life uh, training for, for his ministry. And as he was the very beginning of his ministry, Matthew writes in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it states, From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So again, this is the very beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. And it says, from that time, from the very beginning, Jesus would preach and repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message that Jesus spoke from the very beginning of his ministry was none other than about the kingdom. Get ready, repent for the kingdom is coming and you need to be ready. He thought that people needed to hear a message about the kingdom and that is exactly what Christ did. And it says, from the very beginning, he started it. You know, like, for me, from the age of one, I started to walk. Ever since then, I, I've been walking. From the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he, he started preaching about the kingdom. And ever since then, he was preaching about the kingdom. Not, not a message about going to heaven when you die, or not a message about his death and resurrection, or a message about anything else. His message was about the kingdom. Start preaching about that from the very beginning of his ministry. If we continue along through, through the book of Matthew again, uh, we see that Jesus delivers the Sermon on the Mount, uh, one of the uh, most well-known sermons, uh, perhaps best sermon ever delivered. Um, and uh, Jesus uh, selects his uh, 12 disciples along the way. Uh, he performs a number of miracles, and he's teaching to all these people. And he's continuing to, throughout the years, he's continuing to teach his disciples and raise up his disciples so they could uh, minister to the people. And so we pick up in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, Jesus is getting ready to send out his 12 disciples to do good works. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, it reads, These 12, the 12 disciples that Jesus had, Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
So here we see that Jesus, as he's getting his disciples ready uh, to go minister to the people, uh, he wanted, Jesus wanted his disciples to minister uh, to the children of Israel, the Jews, um, before they were to minister to uh, the Gentiles, the, the non-Jewish people. And Jesus said, when you confront this Jew, these Jewish people, you're mass- proclaim this simple message. The kingdom of heaven is hey. The message that Jesus wanted his disciples to share to, to everybody, to the nations, was a message about the kingdom. Over and over and over again, we see, we see this message of the kingdom at the heart of the life of John the Baptist who prepared the way for Jesus, at the heart of Jesus himself, the Savior, the Christ, and at the heart of Jesus' disciples, the people who were his closest followers. And so over and over again, we see this constant theme of the kingdom. The kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. That's what they talked about. That's what they talked about. Many people seem to think that Jesus' ministry was all about his death and, his death and resurrection. That he would have been uh, telling people all the way from the beginning that, listen guys, I'm going to die for your sins. And on the third day, I'm going to rise victoriously from the grave. No doubt that's very important, and it's a very important message, but that wasn't the message of Jesus. We see in Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, after Jesus is teaching more to, to the Pharisees and to the Jews and to his disciples, performing a few more miracles, miracles uh, this takes place about two-thirds the way into Jesus' ministry. In Matthew chapter 16, we'll read just verses 21 and 22, Jesus is talking to just his disciples. Not to a large crowd or anything. And it says in verse 21, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. So here we see two-thirds the way into Jesus' ministry is when Jesus began. That's just when he began to to share with his disciples, with those he was closest to, that he was going to have to die and rise victoriously on that third day. And Peter was Jesus' closest disciple. I, I would bet that Peter was Jesus' best friend. And Peter was so unfamiliar with this idea that Jesus were to die and be raised on the third day, that he began to rebuke his friend. He began to rebuke his teacher, his master, his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He rebuked him because he had no, he, he, didn't, he didn't know that Christ was supposed to die for the sins of the world because Christ wasn't talking about that. Christ wasn't talking about his death and resurrection throughout his ministry. Christ was talking about the kingdom. The kingdom, that was the heart of Jesus' message. It was all about the kingdom. The kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. And it was so crazy to Peter to think that his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the king, were to have to die for the sins of the world because Christ wasn't really sharing that with them at that time. And it wasn't until two-thirds of the way into his ministry that he began to show his disciples that he he was going to die and be resurrected on that third day. Through the, through the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see the word kingdom occur 121 times. That's incredible. In about 60 chapters in your Bible, 60 chapters all about Jesus and his ministry and the message that he had for the people, it was all about the kingdom. 121 times the word kingdom occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three books that are all about the life of and ministry of Jesus. And so people nowadays, they'll tell you all sorts of things as far as what Jesus' ministry was all about. And, and, and don't believe my word more, more than anybody else. Don't, don't believe your neighbor's word over anybody else. Don't believe your parents. Don't, don't believe that. Believe Jesus' words himself. Believe the words of the Bible that state that the message of Jesus The message of John the Baptist, the message of his disciples, was all about the kingdom. And we can see through this the importance that the kingdom had in their life. As they talked about the kingdom over and over and over again. And we can see the importance that it had to them. 
And today, so, so unfortunately, today, the message of the kingdom seems to be lost among Christianity. There's very few people talking about the message of the kingdom. And that's such a shame because we can see that the message of the kingdom was at the heart of the message of Jesus and John the Baptist and his disciples. And if you're still not convinced that this was the heart of his message, the heart of his ministry, then we need not look further than Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, just, just two books later, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 4, and we're just going to read one verse, verse 43. Jesus is uh, teaching to a group of Jews in, in their town, and uh, they, they, they didn't want Jesus to leave them. But we see, and we're actually going to read two verses, 40, 42 and 43. It says, And when it was day, he being Jesus departed and went to a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. So here Jesus is talking to a group of people, and these people is like, Jesus, please, please don't leave us. We love your company. We love your teachings. We love the miracles that, that you're performing. Please don't leave us. And Jesus says, I have to leave. I have to leave. I have to tell these other people about the, the good news of the kingdom. For I was sent for this purpose. Jesus was sent to this earth for the purpose of, of sharing the message of the gospel of the kingdom. Those are the words of Jesus himself, that he was sent to preach the good news of the kingdom. And so we can see how much they valued the message of the kingdom 2,000 years ago. And somehow, like a real-life game of telephone, somehow, over the span of 2,000 years, Christianity has lost that message. They've lost the message of the kingdom, the heart of Jesus' ministry, the heart of his message, the heart of the gospel message. And somehow, we, we've lost that message. Pe people aren't sharing that message too much anymore. Somewhere along the road, somewhere along those 2,000 years, people decided that, that there are more impor important matters at hand than, than to speak about the kingdom. And now, fortunately, over like the past 20, 25, 40, 50 years, there starts to be a revival again. Not, not, just, not just in the church of God either. It, it, it's, it's a bit spreading throughout all of Christianity. People are starting to talk about the kingdom again. There's starting to be a revival again, and people of all denominations are starting to talk about the kingdom again. And that brings me so much joy. That brings me so much joy that people are beginning to go back to the message, to go back to the ministry that Jesus shared his entire life d d during his ministry because his message was about the kingdom. And people are coming back to that message. And that should bring us so much joy. So much joy that people are starting to talk about this message of the kingdom because it was so important. As God is going to make everything wrong with this world right, in the coming kingdom. It's a message to be excited about. And this message is starting to be revived again. People are starting to talk about it. And I want to be a church that is filled with people that is part of the revival of sharing the gospel message of the kingdom with our friends, with our families, with our co-workers, with, with our friends at school, our teachers, whomever it may be. I want to be a church that's filled with people who are so excited about the kingdom that they have to share with their friends and family this message of the kingdom. Because it was so important to Jesus that that's what his ministry was all about. It was about the kingdom. And if Jesus' message and ministry was about the kingdom, then you bet we, we better be talking about the kingdom as well to our friends and family. And... and I, it's my fear that your friends and families, my, my friends and, and, and such, those people that, that we relate to, it's my fear that they aren't familiar with the message of the kingdom, which is such a huge shame. Because that, again, was the message of Jesus. It was so important to the life of Jesus. 
And so thus far, it better be important in our life. And we better be sharing that message with others. And I hope that this morning I properly demonstrated that Jesus valued the message of the kingdom. That that was the center, the core of his message. As John the Baptist, as he was preparing the way, he talked about the kingdom. Jesus Christ himself talked about the kingdom. And Jesus instructed his disciples, his followers, which by the way, you are Christ's disciples, you are Christ's followers. Jesus instructed them to preach the message of the kingdom. And I, and I hope I have properly demonstrated this morning the importance of the message of the kingdom back in the time of Jesus. And we need to bring that importance back today. Today, in 2019, we need to bring the importance of the kingdom back. And I want to be a church that's filled with people that's part of the revival and getting people excited for the kingdom. And I hope that you, you as God's children, I hope that you seek to learn more about God's kingdom because the God's coming kingdom can, can be a, a somewhat confusing topic at times because not too many people talk about it outside of maybe here. And, and I hope that you seek to want to learn more about the kingdom because we're going we're gonna to spend a couple of weeks talking about the pleasures and the joys and, and delight we'll have in participating in God's kingdom. And I hope that you're excited to hear what's in store for us if we give our life over to God, if we give our life over to Christ. And we will be resurrected just like Jesus did 2,000 years ago. And we will have a never-ending celebration with God and Jesus themselves in God's coming kingdom. For we are a church that exists to grow closer to God and expand his coming kingdom. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for uh, the word that we have, the scripture, your Bible, that we have today. That we can see the word from the lip of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself. And we can see the words that his disciples spoke, a message about your coming kingdom. Father, I just pray that uh, this is a church that is filled with people who is excited about your kingdom. And that excitement encourages them to, to give their life over to you and your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you give us the, the boldness, the, the courage to, to tell our friends and family the message, the good message, the gospel message of the kingdom. Father, we long for that day. We long for the day when Jesus Christ comes back to bring your coming kingdom. We love you so much, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We do long for that day, um, and it's coming. We can see it coming. A time when there's no more sorrow, and no more pain, no more darkness, no more blindness. It's light. Bring me away, take me out to your 
that the message of Jesus was all about the kingdom. The message of John the Baptist as he prepared the way for Jesus was all about the kingdom. And the message of Jesus' disciples was all about the kingdom. And our message should be focused, it should be centered on the kingdom as well. As Jesus Christ died for our sins so that we could be a part of God's coming kingdom. I hope you join us the next couple of weeks as we'll be talking more about the joy that we'll experience in God's coming kingdom. Thank you and have a good week.